Okay, so the CNN town hall. And I really do not like these town halls at all. They're just, especially when they're from CNN, they just ask the most establishment questions ever. Um, there's never really good messages put forward because politicians, when they're speaking to the CNN audience, I feel like they try to speak intentionally vaguely because they don't want to confuse the CNN audience, which is very possible. But um, I, I wanted to go over some of the questions and, and play some clips there, and you could decide for yourself. But I found overall that it was just not very good. It wasn't very enlightening. I didn't really learn anything more about Tulsi Gabbard's positions or her nuanced views. Um, I just learned the basics. Maybe for someone who's not familiar with Tulsi Gabbard, maybe it was a good opportunity for them to get to know her. However, I'm going to play some clips, give my commentary, and you can be the judge. So this was the first question. Hi, Congressman. Um, my question for you tonight is about anti-interventionist. Mm. So um, you've been known for being anti-interventionist, which is the U.S. not going into wars that are backing anti-regime or regime change. Um, but yet you do fight in the military, and thank you for your service. Um, but my question for you is, how can you be both an anti-interventionist and also serve in the military? So this question pretty much sets the theme for the entire town hall. And I'm only going to be going over the foreign policy questions. But this was the, qu the first question they asked. How can you be an anti-interventionist and yet continue to serve in the military? Basically, how can you be an anti-interventionist and not want to kill people? Isn't that what you signed up for? Well, all Tulsa needs to do is just answer this question quite calmly. Um, what I would do is I would say, well, listen, I love the military. I love the U.S. military. That's why I pledge my life to defend this country. I believe you have the right to defend your nation, but we have wars of choice done for economic purposes that don't benefit the American people, but only specific corporations, arms dealers, and American assets in the Middle East. That's what I would say. But let's see what Tulsi says. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for this important question that is personal to me, but is important to all of us as Americans. Um, I'm a soldier. I have served now in the Army National Guard now for nearly 15 years. Uh, I'm a major and I've deployed twice to the Middle East. In Congress, I've served on the Foreign Affairs Committee, in the Armed Services Committee, Homeland Securities Committees now for over the last six years. So I have a very personal understanding as well as an understanding from Washington about the cost of war and who pays the price. Uh, during my first deployment to Iraq, I served in a medical unit where my very first task every single day was to go through a list of names of every single American service member who had been injured in combat the day before. This was the first thing I did every day for the year that I was deployed. And every day, seeing in such a heart-wrenching way who pays the price. And my brothers and sisters who never made that trip home, who paid that ultimate price. And those who did, coming home with wounds, both visible and invisible, that they would continue to struggle with for years after. My position and my commitment in fighting to end these counterproductive regime change wars is based on these experiences and my understanding the cost of war and who pays the price. Yes, it is our service members. It is our troops. It is our military families. It is the people in these countries where these wars are waged who, whose suffering ends up far worse after we launch these regime change wars. But it is also every single one of us here Every single American is paying for these wars through our taxpayer dollars, trillions of our taxpayer dollars being spent, dollars that should be used to invest in and to, to meet the needs and serve the needs of people here at home, to pay for things like health care and education, to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. So as a soldier, I stand ready to serve and protect and defend this country. And as a soldier, I know the cost of war. And as president and commander in chief, I will end these regime change wars. I will work to end this new Cold War 
and this nuclear arms race that is costing us trillions. And again, take those resources, those limited resources, and use them to... Okay, so I think she answered that question pretty well. Um, she kind of attacked the right from the right and the left from the left. She basically, in attacking the right from the right, she basically said, hey, listen, I care about the servicemen. I don't want them to die. And then she attacked the left from the left saying, hey, we're wasting a lot of money on these wars. We can put them in social programs. So I think she did a pretty good job on that. But next, the response is just very weird. Listen. To serve the needs of people here. Which, which wars would you end when you're talking? I mean, that, that's a lot <laughs> that you just laid out there. Wait, 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 wait. Which wars would you end? Not one of the wars that we promote, right? It, it is a lot, but this is the threat that we're facing. Uh, regime change wars that we are seeing still being carried out in Syria. Regime change wars that this current administration is threatening to carry out in countries like Venezuela, laying down the groundwork to carry out a regime change war uh, in Iran. We see throughout decades how this policy has persisted through both Democrat and Republican administrations and the negative impact that these wars have caused. See, what I wish she did, I wish she went into more specifics. Like she could have responded and said, she should have highlighted the cost. So she should have said, we've lost over 3,000 soldiers in the Middle East. We have spent over $3 trillion in the Middle East. We have killed over a million Iraqis. We have 500,000 people have died in Syria due to the civil war. I wish she kind of outlined that. Um, so people can have like a clear understanding of the actual cost. Um, what Trump did when he was running for president and, and he was he, he ran on a pretty much an anti-interventionist agenda as well. What resonated with people is when he said stuff like we spent three trillion dollars in the Middle East and we have won nothing. We have won nothing. And I think Trump was effective because he said that with a lot of intensity and he actually brought up some figures. But that being said, she was interrupted with this uh, follow up question. Congresswoman, you mentioned uh, Syria. We actually have a question on that. I want to bring in Jessica James, a consultant from New Jersey. Hi. Thank you. Um, do you remain s skeptical, as you were in 2017, that Bashar al Assad used chemical warfare against Syrian civilians? Uh, I want to correct that because there's been some misunderstanding. Uh, there have been reports showing that. Chemical weapons have been used in Syria, both by the Syrian government as well as different terrorist groups uh, on the ground in Syria. The skepticism and the questions that I raised were very specific around incidents that the Trump administration was trying to use um, as an excuse to launch a U.S. military attack in Syria. So the Gouda gas attack is what I would have highlighted. And um, I understand why she didn't, because it's just like it's too complicated to explain um, to the CNN audience. However, I would have brought up the Gouda gas attack in 2013. Remember when Obama announced the uh, the red line, or he used the phrase red line a year prior, and he's basically referencing that if Syria used chemical weapons in the war, then that would be a pretext for the U.S. joining the fight on the side of the opposition. The Gouda gas attacks were the ones that seemed the most fraudulent. So just to give you some reference, just so I'm not speaking totally out of my ass, um, on May 30th, 2013, there were a series of raids in Turkey. They raided 13 Al-Qaeda homes that were raided by Turkish border uh, authorities. Um, they did this based off probable cause, so things like wiretaps and things like that. And they recorded that these Al-Qaeda operatives were moving sarin gas into Syria. These people were all arrested. However, the case ends up being dismissed and these Al-Qaeda operatives cross over the border to Syria. One month later, so this is uh, June 20th, I believe, 2013, the Defense Intelligence Ag Agency issued a report saying that al-Nusra had major sarin production units in operation. And uh, I mean, the DIA comes under the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. So this is coming directly out of the highest level of the levels of the Pentagon. One month later, so this is the end of August, the rebels, they make an announcement that there's going to be a war changing development and the U.S. would bomb Syria. So somehow they predict that. And they announce this eight days before the Gouda gas attack. So they, we've established that according to the DIA, rebels have the ability to produce large units of sarin gas and they announce that there's going to be an event that gets the U.S. more involved in the war. Well, what happens after that, the Gouda gas attack happens. 
and Syria decides to cross the red line by firing chemical weapons due to, into a civilian weapon. I mean, into a civilian area. Meanwhile, at the time, Assad is fighting multiple fronts. Why would you use chemical weapons on civilian targets when you're in the middle of a brutal war? Wouldn't you use the chemical weapons on the battlefield? How did the rebels know that the U.S. was going to bomb Syria? And all granted, all this can be completely coincidental. However, two years later, so this is 2015, two members of the Turkish parliament, they came out and they laid out all the evidence that the U.S. and Al-Qaeda executed the U.S. gas attack to provoke the U.S. into higher involvement into the war. So these two people from the Turkish parliament, they were, they were charged with treason after this. With all this, I kind of believe that Turkey was working with Al-Qaeda to create a false flag to get the U.S. further involved in the war. I'm sorry. It, it sounds... I, I've been called an Assad apologist. I've been called all that, um, a Russian apologist as well. But I, when you see shit, when you see things that don't seem true, you have to call it out. And granted, Tulsi Gabbard can't go out of her way to explain all this because she's talking to the CNN audience that does that is very ill-informed and probably doesn't give a shit about foreign policy to begin with. All they know is that, oh, oh, Assad, oh, hey, Normandy, ah, yeah, oh, ah. Is it fucking crazy to think that he didn't use them? Like, is it crazy? Like, are you a Assad apologist? I think Assad did a lot of horrible things in the war. I'm not an Assad apologist. I just don't think he used cross the red line. But whatever, I'm going off the rails right now. Let's get back into this town hall. Now, I served in a war in Iraq, a war that was launched based on lies and a war that was launched without evidence. And so the American people were duped. Good. She brought that up. She brought up that, that we were lied into the Iraq war to set the, at least to set the, the question that maybe we could use an event that may or may not be true to enter into another war front. So as a soldier, as an American, as a member of Congress, it is my duty and my responsibility to exercise skepticism anytime anyone tries to send our service members into harm's way or use our military to go in and start a new war. May I just ask a follow about that? Because, Congresswoman, the Defense Department, the United Nations agree that the Assad regime used chemical weapons against its own people. So, as president, would you trust the conclusions of your government? Uh, well, like I said, we have in our recent past a situation where our own government told lies to the American people as an ex and to the United Nations, for that matter, to launch a war. So what I'm saying is it is our responsibility to exercise due diligence, to ask the tough questions, to get the evidence before we make those very costly decisions about how and when and where our military is used. While we're on the topic of Syria, this week Syrian refugees in Jordan, they requested that the first international criminal court case against the Syrian government commence. You met Bashar al-Assad Assad in 2017. Do you believe that Assad is a war criminal? I think that... I'm just going to go ahead and say that you can certainly make the argument that every single American president since Woodrow Wilson is a war criminal. I think it was Noam Chomsky that said that if we were judging presidents by the uh, Nuremberg standard, then they would all be hung. And he went back and he starts explaining, well, yeah, George Bush did this, that, and that. Bill Clinton did this and that. I mean, last week, a U.S.-led coalition, a.k.a. the Kurds, they used white phosphorus over a village. White phosphorus isn't a chemical weapon. When white phosphorus gets on your skin, it burns your skin off and it seeps into your organs and it causes kidney damage and organ failure and all of that horrible stuff. So if we're talking, if we're calling a spade a spade, then basically every world leader who's been engaged in any type of modern warfare is a war criminal because in modern warfare, when you bomb targets, you kill civilians. That the evidence needs to be gathered. And as I have said before, if there is evidence that he has committed war crimes, he should be prosecuted as such. But you're not sure now. Everything that I have said requires that we take action based on evidence. The evidence is there. There should be accountability. That's fair enough. She's doing a pretty good job speaking to a broad audience right now. She can't get too into the weeds with this stuff. She needs to give some general answers. So I think that she's she's doing a fair job. Me, you know, I like 
someone with a sharp tongue who goes really into the weeds, but she's not speaking to me. She's not speaking to the people who already support her. She's speaking to the people that don't probably don't really know her. So she needs to be vague. However, you could also say that this is the opportunity for her to get on the national stage because I've been talking to just like random nonpartisan people and they don't know who Tulsi Gabbard is, which is kind of sad. Like there's not that much press coverage of her. So should she go the Trump direction and say things and, and just be very, very sharp with her tongue and say uh, not outrageous stuff, but just pr- say kind of like um, tra- say things that are – brutally honest that are going to get her media attention i think that's the way that she needs to go if she's going to get elected or at least get international recognition or national recognition rather because the fact is when you speak tamely in this political climate not saying it's right or wrong i'm just saying that the media is not going to cover you as much and when you're running against other democrats that have a brand name like bernie sanders like elizabeth warren it's going to be harder for you So now is the time to be a little aggressive, right? Okay, so the next question has to do with Omar Alan's alleged anti-Semitic comments, as you would definitely expect would be asked in this. (laughs) You you definitely knew that this was going to be asked. Okay, we're going to get to our next audience question. Uh, It comes from Beth Gendler, who is the executive director of the National Council of Jewish Women in Minnesota and also the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. As a co-founder of the Muslim and Jewish Women of Minnesota Policy Collaborative, I'm troubled by the increase in both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism that's infecting discourse on both sides of the political aisle. Regardless of where it comes from, it puts both of our communities in real danger. As president, what can you do in terms of policy and position to combat racism and bigotry no matter where it comes from? Thank you. Thank you, Beth, and thank you for your leadership in this area yeah thanks for your leadership in this area yeah so this is obviously the lead up to the uh omar alan situation all about the benjamins tweet so let's hear her response to this Uh, and this is this is so important Um, we see incidents uh, occurring far too often where there is not only hateful words and bigotry but actual violence Uh, being used against people because of the color of our skin or the way that we choose to worship. Uh, As a practicing Hindu, uh, I have been on the receiving end of Hindu phobia and bigoted attacks. Uh, The very first time that I ran for Congress in 2012, my Republican opponent that time uh, said on television that I was not qualified to serve in Congress because my being a Hindu contradicted the United States Constitution. Uh, Unfortunately, even now, as I stand before you here today and running for president, those Hindu phobic attacks continue. Attacks against Christians, Muslims, Jews, atheists, people of all different religions cannot be allowed to stand. And what is most important is to lead from the front. Yes, as president of the United States, I will do that in calling out and condemning those bigoted attacks. But this is something that each and every one of us has the opportunity to do when we are confronted with such bigotry. It is only when we stand together and speak out against and condemn this kind of bigotry and the violent acts that sometimes occur as a result that we can actually change, make that real change we know we need to see. And Congresswoman, if you you want to sit. I just want to ask you a follow-up question on this very topic because... You voted this past week to condemn uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. And this vote, of course, came after your fellow Democratic Congresswoman, Ilan Omar, suggested that support for Israel in Congress is, quote, all about the Benjamins, and criticized lawmakers just this past week for supporting Israel as potentially having, quote, allegiance to a foreign country. What do you think about these statements, and do you think this is anti-Semitic? Uh, Well, let's look at the bigger issue here. The bigger issue is, uh, there's a couple actually, of of making sure that as members of Congress and as people in this country, we can have open dialogue uh, about our foreign policy. Um, You know, as as there are uh, criticisms levied about uh, dual loyalty, again, as I mentioned in the last question, 
I've been on the, on the receiving end of those types of attacks. So I can understand um, how offensive they can be. Where just because I am a Hindu, people assume that therefore I must be loyal to some other interest or but, some other but place. What it I don't think Tulsi was really prepared to answer this question. She was answering it with a lot of vagueness and fluff. What she should say is, no, I don't think they're anti-Semitic. Alana's under fire because she dared to open up a discussion about the Israel lobby and specifically AIPAC and its influence over Congress through the orchestration of campaign contributions. And she's raising a serious question. And you have to ask yourself, why is Congress in such a frenzy over this? Bigotry and racism is unacceptable in all forms. And of course, Jewish people should never be collectively condemned because of the influence over one foreign lobby. But we still need to ask questions about how these different lobby groups influence our day-to-day -day lives and our policy as Americans. That's all she really needed to say. But of course, no politician would ever dare say that. But what about these specific statements? You're talking broadly. These specific statements, were they anti-Semitic? Uh, there are people who have expressed their offense at these statements. I think that what Congresswoman Omar was trying to get at was a deeper issue related to our foreign policy. And I think there's an important discussion that we have to be able to have openly, even though we may end up disagreeing at the end of it, that we've got to be able to have that openness to have the conversation. But you're not willing to go as far what as I'm saying, saying it's anti-Semitic. Is, is what... So you're not going to come out and speak up for the Jewish community? You're not going to call her an anti-Semite? Are you anti-Semitic? It certainly seems it. You are brown, aren't you? I heard them brown people are all anti-Semites, especially the Muslims. And Hindu and Muslims are the same thing, right? Huh? One just has a dot, right? Huh? She was trying to bring up was, so, I, was something that was, was a deeper issue. Okay. And I don't believe that she... That her intent was to, to cause any offense to anyone. You can kind of tell that she believe like, she definitely doesn't believe that her comments were anti-Semitic, and she definitely does question the Israel lobby. You can, you can tell that she's trying to skate around it too much, where she's just being so openly vague. Yeah, she came out at the end and said, no, I don't think that her intention was to be anti-Semitic. Not saying it wasn't anti-Semitic. Her intention was not anti-Semitic, and she was raising a serious issue, which is... She's getting the point across, but I wish she was a little bit more direct on this. She's not obviously, she's obviously not going to run with uh, Alon's comments or anything like that. So let's move on. And um, the next, I'm going to skip through this because the next questions are more, mainly uh, domestic policy stuff. And I just want to concentrate on the foreign policy stuff. But um, this really strange ca question came up and uh, I'm going to play it. And it revolves around Hindu nationalism. This was one of the main smears on her, too. Hi, Tulsi. Um, I wanted to ask, what has your Hindu faith brought into your life? And mm -hmm. also, how do you respond to being attacked for being in support of Hindu nationalists? You know, I grew to uh, understand from a young age, uh, being raised in a, a multi-faith home, uh, my mom's a practicing Hindu, my dad's Catholic. And so for us as kids, we grew up studying and reading from both the Bhagavad Gita as well as the New Testament. So we heard stories about Krishna and Arjuna at night when we were going to sleep, as well as stories about Jesus of Nazareth. But what we learned from a young age from these scriptures was um, that real happiness in life can only be found when you're dedicating your life in the service of God and in the service of others. Truly uh, finding ways, no matter what path we chose in life, to make a positive impact on those around us and to be good stewards of our home, to take care of this planet. Uh, so throughout my life, I have um, done my best in different ways to be able to, to do that, to dedicate my actions, whether it was uh, environmental work in Hawaii as a teenager, uh, running for state uh, house in Hawaii when I was 21 years old, uh, served on the city council, and then, of course, now in Congress, uh, as well as serving as a soldier uh, in the Army National Guard. I really suspect the reason why CNN and other mainstream media outlets are bringing up her Hindu faith is because they want to make it clear that she's not a Christian. 
because let's be honest, there's never been a president who hasn't been a Christian. So I, I really think this is an attempt to bring up the fact that she's a Hindu so she won't win votes in the South because let's just be completely honest, most Southerners won't vote for a non-Christian. So, I mean, that's what, that was, I mean, that's not 100% fair, but like that was one of the things that DNC, the DNC was trying to do to fuck over Bernie Sanders. They were trying to play on his Jewish card. So I really think they're trying to make the point that this girl's Hindu. She's not, she's not a Christian. Isn't that weird? And what the fuck is with that guy calling her Tulsi like he's on a first name basis with her? You call her Congresswoman Gabbard. To, to, I want to address the second part of your question, though. Um, accusations like the type you mentioned are just another form of Hindu phobic attacks that unfortunately I and so many others Hindus in this country have been on the receiving end of along with Muslims, along with people of other religions. And it is, it is exactly these kinds of attacks that not only Hindus must stand up and speak out against, but every single one of us, no matter where the attack is coming from or who it is being targeted to, if we want to change this culture of hate and bigotry, every one of us must stand up and speak with one voice to condemn it because an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. And I'm not taking clips from the entire thing, but this goes on forever. Like, they ask her about Hindu nationalism and her Hindu faith a lot. And we get it. We get it that she is Hindu. This goes on for another 10 minutes or so. They just keep on asking her about her Hindu faith. It's just, it gets ridiculous. But um, the next question, not foreign policy related, but I found it interesting regardless. Um, someone asked her about gay marriage. Or more specifically, um, her... I guess her the claims that she was for conversion therapy. I'll let it play. Um, can you convince me that your prior positions on gay rights have truly changed? Um, I'm especially concerned about your previous support of conversion therapy, which I find really, really repulsive. And I'd like to understand what caused you to reevaluate your positions and change them. Thank you for your question. I want to correct the record on something that's very important that you raised. Uh, I personally never supported uh, any kind of conversion therapy. I never advocated for conversion therapy. And frankly, I didn't even know what conversion therapy was until... Smear attack alert. This is a CNN smear attack. They've obviously filtered this guy to ask that question and throw conversion therapy up in the air. I've looked into it. She wasn't for gay marriage when she was a young, when she was younger, when she was in her early 20s. She was never for conversion therapy. It's ridiculous. The claims on her, on that, on her gay marriage or, or the, her, her belief in conversion therapy are completely false fake news smear attempts. And that's why they filtered this ridiculous question on in the first place. Just the last few years, uh, I think it was when I was first running for Congress when someone was asking me about it. Uh, I was raised in a very socially conservative home. Uh, my father is Catholic. He was uh, a leading voice against gay marriage in Hawaii during that time. Again, I was very young, uh, but these were the values and the beliefs that I grew up around. My own personal journey as I went out uh, in different experiences in my life especially going and deploying to the Middle East, uh, where I saw and firsthand the negative impact of a government attempting to act as a moral arbiter for their people, dictating in the most personal ways how they must live their lives. And so it caused me to confront um, that contradiction, where as a soldier standing for freedom for all people, here in this country, but also how that contradicted with some of those values and beliefs that I grew up with. Uh, I also served with uh, gay and lesbian and trans service members, and we became very good friends uh, and knew in the most deep and visceral way that I would give my life for any one of them. Okay, this goes on for another couple of minutes, and uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but... 
CNN is so much harder on Tulsi Gabbard than they ever were Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, despite their views being exactly the same. And Tulsi Gabbard came around. She has one of the um, pro-LGBTQ voting records out there. I think it's like rated 100%, whatever that means. But she is like thumbs up in that community as far as her voting record is is concerned. That's all that really matters anyway. Who cares if she didn't believe, due to her religion or due to whatever faith, you don't believe in it in a personal level. As long as she's not trying to prevent people from actually getting married, then there's no problem. God damn. Leave it alone. It's, it's a ridiculous question that she believes in conversion therapy. It's a smear attack. This is why CNN sucks. All right. So this next question, this is going to be the last question I go over, but it is weird. Hi. What do you believe has been the biggest policy mistake of the United States since creation? Dear God. That kind of sounded like a Care Bear. Let me play that again. Hi. Jesus Christ. What is this girl, like 10 years old? One more time. Hi, what do you believe has been the biggest policy mistake of the United States since creation? If you do not say slavery, then you are a fucking racist. So choose wisely. Wow. (laughs) Since creation. Of the United States. Uh, Right, yes. (laughs) Yes, I don't don't know that I could go back that far. (laughs) Um... Well, look, I'm going to point to the one that that strikes a chord with me uh, most deeply personally. Um, And it has to do with the cost of war. Um, We are in a situation today where we here in the United States uh, and the world are at a greater risk of nuclear catastrophe than ever before in history. A greater risk today than ever before of nuclear catastrophe. About a year ago in Hawaii, um, this became all too clear to us. Uh, It was January of 2018, right? That's what year we're in. Um, It was January of last year, uh, early in the morning, when there was a cell phone message, an alert that went out to over a million phones across our state. And that alert read, missile incoming, seek shelter, this is not a drill. So it, it might be hard for some of you to imagine what went through our minds, but it was terrifying knowing that we had just minutes to live. Minutes to live. And so we had uh, uh, parents who were piling their kids into cars and trying to drive towards the mountains to see if there was a cave that might provide some shelter and safety. There was a father who lowered his little girl down a manhole thinking that maybe, maybe she might be protected there. People trying to decide, who do I spend, what member of my family, which one of my children do I spend the last minutes of my life with? So this alert turned out to be false, but the reason why... We reacted the way that we did is because the threat is real. It's as real for us as we sit here today in Austin, as it is for everyone who's watching from home. Uh, Our leaders have failed us and brought us to this point. It doesn't have to be this way. We have to correct our course. We have to end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race that is uh, currently being waged that threatens our very future, and that costs us trillions of our taxpayer dollars, dollars that need to be spent and invested to serve the needs of our people here at home. Uh, This is what I'm committed to doing. This This is why I'm running for president, to change these policies, to end these regime change wars, end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, and take our resources and put them where they need to be, in our people and in our future. Okay, I'm going to wrap this thing up soon. Um, But yeah, overall, very weird question, by the way. And that girl had a very squeaky voice. But overall, obviously, this wasn't very productive. Um, These CNN town halls aren't very productive. But I still thought it was pretty interesting to see her, see, I guess, her MO, at least, and how she's trying to present herself to the mainstream liberals in the world. Um, I'm going to give you my feedback right now and what I think the chances are of Tulsi Gabbard actually becoming president of the United States. 
I think they're pretty low. And here's what I think. I think that she has the best chance in the field to defeat Donald Trump in the 2020 election. However, I think they're going to give her the Ron Paul treatment at the end of the day. They're going to ignore her. And whenever they bring her up, they're going to bring up these ridiculous claims about conversion therapy, these ridiculous claims about her being an Assad apologist, these ridiculous claims about her being a Hindu nationalist. I think they're going to try to use all of that combined to make her look like a nutter. And uh, it's unfortunate because I do like Tulsi Gabbard. Um, I thought she did an okay, an okay job. But I think if she is going to stand a chance in the primary, she's going to have to develop a little bit of a sharper tongue and uh, get some more like free press and media. I mean, that's how Donald Trump won. Donald Trump was a, started off as a... I mean, he still is a buffoon, but he started off as a crazy buffoon talking about birther certificates and, and stuff like that. Not saying it's right, but if I was a political strategist, that would be the way I would go. I would go a little bit more on the uh, earned media type of route. But she is very well-spoken and kind of laid back, so I, I don't know. Um, but you're going to see people who are more forward with their agendas, I think, get pushed up to DNC. And, and I think right now Bernie Sanders is probably the favorite for the DNC um, for the DNC primary. But overall, this wasn't very productive. <laughs> Not the podcast. The podcast, the point was to show you how shitty CNN is. Because let's be honest. And I also wanted to spread some light on some of the serious stuff because that's like one of the things that I follow a lot. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I think I'm going to wrap this up right here. And uh, I love you all. Uh, we're going to be doing a Yemen Q&A later this week. Uh, we're going to go into the weeds and why the war started, how the war started, the geopolitical implications. Make sure that you rate and review the podcast as always. Um, it's always a really big help as far as our rankings are concerned. And uh, I love you all. Peace.